everybody. Welcome to History Boys. I am Tyler Armantrout. I am a history boy hanging out with I, I usually stay sitting next to, but uh, we're yeah, all doing I'll, it uh, via satellite this week. That's why, uh, really that's why my normal velvety voice sounds so shitty, because we're all in separate bunkers this time. I'm Chris Whedon, bunker boy. Uh, <laughs> I'm Zach Mech. Uh I am also a history boy. Welcome to Quarantine Edition. Yeah. 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 I'm Jerry Nash. I'm also a history boy. We're all uh, sitting... Alone in our respective we're, homes. We're at Ground Zero, yeah. gang. Uh, yeah. The coronavirus has uh, destroyed our, our way of life, and here we are all hiding out. And through the power of the internet, we found a way not to all die drunk and alone. Yeah. Yeah. We can still bring you History Boys content. Oh, big time. Yeah. Pantsless, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I we're never wearing I'm... pants. It's just now we're not wearing pants at home. <laughs> I'm wearing pants. I put on pants for this. But you're yeah. wearing them on the top half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is, yeah, that's a fact. You got the pant legs that. on your arms and your dick's hanging out. I think you might have hacked into my pet camera. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's my pet camera. You're my pet. Oh, we all nice. have pet cameras. Jack, do you okay, have a pet okay. camera? I don't have a pet camera. No. Mm. Get on that. All right, I'll joke in aside. Last week we had a uh, a pretty intense saga with uh, with with uh, President Garfield, but we're moving into the flip side today. Uh, Jerry, do you want to tell us a little bit about today's episode? Yeah, today uh, we're we're doing kind of a companion piece to uh, last time uh, James Garfield, the assassination of that. This one just sort of goes with that, uh, like we said. Uh, today we're talking about the uh, inherited presidency of Chester Arthur, one of the most obscure presidents in our nation's history. And I know what you guys are thinking. And no, he's not a molester. Just not all Chesters are molesters. <laughs> Just the one from uh, Lincoln Park. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. May yes. he rest in peace. It's the earliest in an episode we've ever had a tangent that we need to cut. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, didn't you have something that you had to add uh, oh, from yes. last week? Yes. So oh, was one about thing, Jake. one thing, yeah, one thing that I teased in the last episode that we actually never got to. Uh, I just kind of lost my train of thought on it. But uh, when they were doing the autopsy of Charles Gateau, they found something very strange with him. Charles Gateau had a condition that was known as phimosis which is the inability to retract the foreskin on his dick okay so some people at the time thought it caused insanity (laughs) so what what (laughs) like if you look this up it is the there's a picture of a dick with phimosis on uh wikipedia what happens is like when you piss like the foreskin around the head of your dick like balloons out and like shoots out. Hilarious. Oh no. <laughs> what? <laughs> what yeah. the actual fuck? <laughs> and folks, feel free to look this up on your own because feel free. <laughs> this will not be on our social media. No, <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> that would get taken down in yeah, a heart. We we would get zucked super hard. Yeah. But I yeah. really hope that after if I wait like a week after this episode goes out and I go to Google and I put Charles Gateau. It's going to autofill penis. And uh, (laughs) we can make it happen, people, if we put our minds to it. Yeah. I just, uh, it was too silly to pass up. I had to mention that. Yeah. So did they know that when he was alive or did they only find out after he died? Well, they found that out after he died, but I'm sure that anyone that slept with knew knew about it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it gives more uh, it gives kind of uh, a little bit more weight to uh, when he was in the free love commune and he was uh, nicknamed Charles get out <laughs> yeah, right. was short for Charles get out. Your dick's too weird. Right. Yeah. <laughs> weird ass dick. <laughs> yeah. So Chester Allen Arthur was the 21st president of the United States after James Garfield was assassinated by the deranged office seeker slash traveling preacher slash lawyer Charles Gateau. He was everyone's last pick to be president because of his political ties. <laughs> to this like, day, this guy. 
uh, Arthur is near the top of the most obscure presidents in our nation's history. And I, I, I just want to say that uh, in the last episode, we talked a lot about having all of your honorifics be in your name. And I think with Charles, <laughs> Gattel, it would it would have been it would have been uh, like failed preacher, failed, you know, failed, I guess, political aspiry. Yeah. <laughs> right. Lawyer. Yeah. Failed everything. But failure. Uh, failure. So Chester Arthur was born on October 5th, 1829, in Fairfield, Vermont, to an Irish immigrant abolitionist Presbyterian preacher. And if you uh, check out his birthplace, uh, which is kind of funny, the, there's the house still exists. Uh, we'll post pictures. It's it's kind of funny because it looks like a drawing of a house, like a, of like a kid's drawing of a house. <laughs> it's like a square. With like two windows and a door. <laughs> Does it have a stove pipe <laughs> chimney? Yeah, it's, it's, like it's pretty great. funny. <laughs> oh my God. Really cute smoke coming out the top. Yeah, <clears throat> and there's a weird. There's a bunch of stick figures that stand out in front, like a mom and dad, a kid, <laughs> and like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, one one other thing. I will say, it sounds like his up his upbringing was uh, was modest, but not log cabin modest. So no. I'm just going to point no. that out. No, it, it wasn't. They weren't impoverished like Garfield was, uh, but they were far from rich. You know what I mean? They put right. paid good money for those stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Arthur uh, was able to attend the law school at Union College in Schenectady, Schenectady, New York. He wasn't a standout student like Garfield, though. So uh, he was kind of average? Yeah, he was like sort C++. of an average student. Yeah, uh, he was bright, but he just wasn't like the, you know, the dynamo that Garfield like schools was. for nerds. Yeah. It's probably like regular size, not a very fast runner, totally normal penis. Nothing, nothing <laughs> crazy going on there. No, Arthur, he liked to party with his school nice. buddies. All right, I like, like him already. already. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> if you're uh, listening to the podcast, that's our metric for liking somebody. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it was here that he got his first taste of politics. Uh, by joining the Whig Party in support of Henry Clay. Nice. Uh, even going so far as to, like, brawl with a bunch of James K. Polk supporters, which is kind of awesome. Like, literally? Yeah, like, actually, like, getting in a fight with Straight James K. Polk cups. supporters. Yeah. <laughs> in the 1840s, people heard the word millionaire for the first time. Ooh. While income inequality was maybe at its highest. It was dubbed yeah. the Gilded Age by Mark Twain, but it was certainly only gilded for the few. Mm. Well, for some like people, they were, they, they were gilded, but they were gilded in soot around their three-year-old factory worker child <laughs> faces. And, yeah. uh, or gilded with amputated limbs from getting caught in the gears of the factories. So, you yeah. know, gilded could mean yeah. a lot of things. Right, right. But it wasn't like Europe, though, uh, where money was inherited and the rich people didn't do anything. Uh, the rich people in America were businessmen. Uh, in 1853, Arthur moved to New York uh, to work for the Erastus Culver Law Firm, where he quickly became a junior partner. He, Yeah, he was a lawyer and a pretty good one, actually. He'll get you uh, out. Yeah, at 24 mm. years old. And then he'll defend you in court. Boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> at 24 years old he got his first case and this is kind of a landmark case this is uh let's see this was way let's see this is way before oj almost uh, almost 100 <laughs> years before rosa parks oh and it's kind of the same sort of deal elizabeth jennings uh, was a 27-year-old teacher at the private African free school and an organist at the First Colored Congregational Church in Show New off. York City. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on July 16th, 1854, Jennings and a friend waited for a horse-drawn streetcar, and they were late for church that day. It was a, it was a Sunday. God's going to uh, be this, so mad at them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, this streetcar didn't have the coloreds only sign on it but since it stopped they decided to board the streetcar anyway now the irish conductor stopped them and said that the car was full and that there would be another one coming along for quote her people mm, nah. 
And she so said, other people going to church, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> church going folk. Yeah, she said that she didn't have people. She just wanted to go to church. Good for her. After yeah, after some back and forth, the conductor said, "Okay, but if anyone says anything, you're off," which totally pissed her off. Which right. understandably so. Yeah. Right. Uh, she said that she was a respectable teacher, born and raised in New York City, and that it was clear that the conductor wasn't, that he was an Irish immigrant. He wasn't even from there. Oh, She's like, man. I've been here my whole life. Racism's yeah. flying both ways in this scenario. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> also, uh, I'm going to give her points for using the, do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> so the driver and the conductor, they try to physically remove her. But she she grabbed onto the curtains of the window of the streetcar and like they couldn't get her off. <laughs> so they were like, ah, leave her. And like they kept going and like they they saw a cop on the street and they they're like, hey, can you get this lady off? We told her to to you know get off. She won't get off. So the cop had her arrested. Mm. By today's standard, those curtains would have come right off, but that's because they don't make them like they used to. I mean, back in those <laughs> days, curtains stayed on. They were sturdy. They were made to last. So they kind of shot themselves in the foot with that one. Yeah. <laughs> so Jennings filed a lawsuit against the conductor, the driver, and the Third Avenue Railway Company for $500 in damages, Ooh. which is a lot of money back then. That would have right. been like, Almost fifteen grand, I think, back then. Damn. Yeah, and Arthur was her lawyer, and with uh, his representation, she won that case, and she was awarded two hundred and fifty dollars. Nice. And so the full five hundred, which would have been uh, a little over uh, seven uh, seventy five hundred dollars in today's money. Hey, not, that's not bad. Nah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good, and it was celebrated. Uh, for a long time after that in New York City, you know, by by black people uh, in the city, they, w- they would celebrate it and mark the uh, occasion of right. when the court case came out. So, right. Uh, Very nice. Kind of forgotten now, but. Right. Yeah. It was a land Big deal at the time. Yeah. Arthur was also a polling inspector and worked on the John C. Fremont campaign in 1856. He was the first. Republican candidate for president in United States history, but Fremont lost to the Democrat James Buchanan, probably one of our worst presidents, if not the worst president we've ever had. Yeah, you Mm -hmm. mentioned that both Polk and Buchanan sucked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Who's either in a previous episode or in the chat? Yeah, we've had a lot of really bad presidents uh, (laughs) during this time. what that's like. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Now, although... Uh, Fremont didn't win. Arthur found himself in the good graces of the New York Republican Party boss, Thurlow Weed. There's a name. That's quite a name. In 1859, Arthur married Ellen Lewis Herndon. Oh. Or as everyone called her, Nell. Oh, oh I thought you were going to say Herney. right when the new york state governor at the time edward morgan wanted a new general staff there would be these like uniformed guys with like gold braids uh like around their shoulders and stuff uh to make himself look more official at public events uh arthur was chosen to be among them with weed's recommendation yeah so So he got to like yeah so you said gold braids like on their uh, on their shoulders and stuff. Yeah, yeah. To make I, them look like official. Yeah, uh, that just reminds me of uh, like like the Zeon forces from Gundam. Like that's their uniform <laughs> shit. Yeah, right. I was thinking Captain Crunch. Or that. Yeah. There you go. I. I was just, uh, I was thinking about the things I've done on Weed's recommendation in the past, and it's mostly just these snacks. <laughs> yeah. It was purely an ornamental position until April of 1861 when the Civil War broke out, when it actually became a legit position. In the Civil War, the governors of each state had their own war department that would provide supplies, men, and equipment for the Union Army. And Chester Arthur was appointed as a brigadier general, being the state quartermaster representative. 
this this would deal with uh you know blankets, rations, housing, clothes, any equipment for the war effort. Basically anything short of just manpower, uh Arthur was in charge of. And he became an expert in all of it very quickly. And he was eventually promoted to inspector general for a New York state, which was like looking after forts and the state's defenses for the war. Mm. So he, it was his job to find like pillows and blankets and, you know, stuff for forts. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wasn't, uh, wasn't our buddy from last week, uh, also a general. Yes, he was, or, uh, but he Gar- wasn't, but Garfield wasn't a brigadier general. Was he? I can't he remember. Was, yes. Oh, he was. Yes. Uh, Yes, yes, they were. They, uh, Arthur and Garfield were both generals. So yeah. they worked together. In they some didn't capacity? work together. Okay. They didn't work together because they were from different states, and each state had their own thing. Uh, they okay. kind of it. It's kind of a you know. It, it's sort of like a pyramid. Like you have the Union Army at the top, and then it goes down through the states. You know, and the states filter back up to the Union Army. If and you get sense. people to be generals under you, and then they get people to be generals <laughs> under them. <laughs> and then, and again, multi-level marketing. Multi-level, yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, We're right back with to multi-level marketing. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an inverted <laughs> pyramid. <laughs> ah. However, in 1864, the New York Democrats took over, and Edwin Morgan's staff was out including Arthur, because that's kind of how it worked at the time that with the administration, all of your guys that you had appointed were now done with you. So all new people were appointed. Uh, so yeah, Arthur lost his job. You get a um, new, new hot young team coming in, shaking things yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> now Ooh. Arthur could have signed up to fight, uh, but he didn't. Uh, for a few reasons, but the biggest reason was that Nell had been born in Culpeper, Virginia, mm. and she and her family were Confederate sympathizers. Ew! Yeah. I don't like her anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she's to sort of go ahead. She's just like I'm your banging hot wife, and I like to do all the different things. Want to hear some of my controversial opinions? My family shares them, and you're like, uh, but she'll do anything. <laughs> so you just have to deal with her, uh, you know, um, hardcore racism. Yeah, <laughs> she, she was a bit of a Zoe de Chanel uh, back in those days. She's a little bit equally quirky, as racist, uh, equally as racist, casual <laughs> anal, you know, the the usual. <laughs> <laughs> she's like yeah. i'm not like the others uh yeah. i think I'm that some racist. people are born better than others <laughs> genetically <laughs> uh, yeah zoe de chanel said that yeah <laughs> is that the Oscar? look online the quotes are out there follow the money <laughs> uh it's not true please don't sue us zoe yeah so to ease familial tensions he refrained from having anything else to do with the war, uh, there was one thing that Chet Arthur wanted now, and that was to become rich. You uh, need yeah. you need both, buddy. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, you if your nickname baby. is Chet, definitely. Like, she needs his boat shoes. He needs to be part of the yacht club. <laughs> uh, he's got to have his sweater tied around his uh, his fucking neck, you know. He, he needs a scandal involving a dead hooker in the uh, marina, you oh, know, exactly. rich people stuff. Rich people, exactly. Stuff. I just imagine him having all these like sitcom style get rich quick schemes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, just real quick, machine politics worked like this: if you were involved at all with the party or the elected campaigns, then you were entitled to get a job in the administration oh, regardless yeah. of your experience. That seems like there a were, great idea. Yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, there were several tiers to this as well. The bottom positions being bell ringer, street sweeper, and just general laborer. Like Ooh. for the state. General laborer. Yeah, yeah. 
so is this almost like a like a an automated version of the spoil system? This is the spoil system. Okay, yes. that's what I've yeah. Well, because I mean, yeah, yeah it only rather than having to wait in line, it's just if you're a part of the party that gets elected, you're just given. I mean, is this a little bit different? Is it kind of the same? No, this is exactly what the spoil system is. This is just okay. on a more local level. Like the the machine, there was always a political machine in every metropolitan city, right? Um, and that's kind of how politics in America worked at that time. Oh man, the spoil system. Can you imagine? I feel like machines just came out, so they needed to like start putting that on everything to make it sound futuristic. <laughs> yeah, it was a machine because you know they kept churning things out. Yeah, you know, churn, right. you know uh, they, it, it it was this this well oiled uh, machine machine of power. It's structure well, of power. A lithe, well oiled machine with rock hard abs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the next tier. Being police officers, tax assessors, commissioners of deeds, yeah. and judges. Ooh. And that was sort of the tier above that, right? You're like, hey, so, thanks for so, uh, your help. Uh, you want to be a judge? Yeah, yeah, but pretty much. Yeah. I'd rather be an executioner. Nice. Well, I mean, isn't that what a cop is? <laughs> nice. <laughs> the tier above that were mayors, aldermen, and party assemblymen. Th- these guys made the machine work, right? They were the party planning the- committee. Exactly, exactly. Like Halloween, Easter, you know. They got all but- that. <laughs> well, I mean, you got School female dances. horses up in there, so... Mayors. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the top tier that was the most sought after. Those were the federal jobs appointed by the party bosses and then ratified by the president. And there weren't many of these jobs. There were 700 in New York. But the most lucrative one of all was the New York Customs House, which dealt with 75% of all import duties arriving in the United States. Question. Yeah. Isn't isn't that kind of what we're dealing with right now with the New York uh, Customs? Uh, in, oh. regard, in regards to uh, what's going on with the Fed and stocks? In, in a sense, yes. We, it, In a lot of ways, we have backslid a little bit back to where we were in this time frame. A lot of this stuff is going to sound familiar, but let, let me kind of – let me just kind of pick it apart. Okay. And it will become clear to you like – how messed up our country is right now. (laughs) You know, let's give Jerry an opportunity to put his fingies in those wet holes. Yeah, (laughs) Come on, doctor. Yeah. So the collector of the customs house would get a cut of everything right down to the fines that were issued to some of the people coming into the ports. So some people who weren't already rich, saw the spoil system, a.k.a. the patronage system, this whole machine system, as upward mobility, whereas the elites of New York rightly thought that the civil service should be in the public trust and divorced from partisan politics, which I agree with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I Uh, think um, I think with politics and and with with these types of pursuits, it should be money or power, because if you have both, then I mean, then you're just able to rig things. Exactly. But but the problem is that money is power. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it'll find a way like money will find a way. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And political, yeah, political machines with all the money and power, they were brazen about ballot stuffing and voter suppression of the opposition. Like they'd come up to like lines of voters and like break them up if they knew that they were voting for the other guy. <laughs> like they'd be violent about their voter suppression. Jeez. They would put flagrant yeah. lies about their political po- opponents on social media and uh, rig voting <laughs> yeah. machines and, yep. uh, and already decide who their nomination candidate was going to be well before the primaries. Yeah. Yep. Glad that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So after the war with military, and I'm going to kind of come back to to that political machine and the spoils system because that has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. But let me just come back to that. 
So yeah, after the war with military administration, administrative experience, Arthur found work as a lobbyist for people seeking government jobs, just like everyone else, right? Like sure. everyone else was. Yeah. He was just like a consultant. He would try to get you those government jobs for a fee. Yeah. And there were always clients. So Arthur started to amass wealth very quickly. He bought a brownstone at 123 Lexington, Lexington Avenue, yeah. which is still there to this day. And then he bought a bunch of uh, real estate to go along with his giant brick of heroin. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Mr. Brownstone. <laughs> I thought you were going to say he's going to build an ugly tower in New York. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, his house was outfitted with the most expensive furniture and decor, like Tiffany stuff. Like he knew Tiffany. Ah. Um, I wonder what she, she was like, full... <laughs> Oh, no. Like... <laughs> you know, the, 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 famous jeweler and no i know yeah but she was still a okay. bitch the, the the one that uh covered i think we're alone now and had the music yeah that's what i'm thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah tiffany she's hot yeah uh was there's actually a great documentary called i think we're alone now about yep. stalkers i highly yeah. recommend it it's so <laughs> I good. highly recommend that yeah oh, i wish i was her stalker nice <laughs> uh he also had a full irish immigrant staff Oh. So he had kind of a typhoid Mary kind of a thing going on. Okay. You know? <laughs> so, so, so question. Well, all Irish have typhoid. No, no, but, but all but, typhoid you know, have Irish. It's a, it's one of those logical <laughs> things in the SAT. <laughs> but if typhoid Mary was alive during this time, she would have worked for someone like Arthur, maybe yeah. even Arthur, you know, she probably would have yeah. worked for him. Arthur loved to party and his parties were legendary. Nice. Hell yeah. Regular yeah. Uh, Jimmy Gatz. Neil, Neil Patrick Harris. I All thought right. you were going to talk about, I thought you were going to say Andrew WK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's going to play him in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least his clone will. Yeah. Because you yeah. know they've replaced yeah. him. Oh, they iced That's him. Andrew right. WK? Yeah. <laughs> I read it. I read it in a book. Online. <laughs> oh, God. Online. One of those online books with GIFs in it. Yeah, the, yeah. The, you know those books that are just lists and pictures? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's on a place called BuzzFeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they would roll, like, red carpets out to the curb so no one would have to step on the gross sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Everyone, like, dressed to the nines. They had champagne and whiskey and Havana cigars. And they would party into, like, Three to five o'clock in the morning, and then and Chet uh, Arthur was always the last one to turn in. Nice. Uh, they were so rich that instead of putting their keys in a bowl, they put their monocles in a bowl and then swapped wives. <laughs> 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 but you know, like those those like cartoons and stuff of like those like rich capitalists like sitting around smoking cigars and laughing and talking about like planning like their next political get rich move you yeah. know yeah yeah this is exactly that this yeah. is exactly what they're doing it's a bunch of like l like very literally like fat cats sitting around uh smoking cigars and planning the future of the united states they're all but, just a living heavily cross-hatched cartoon in like the new yorker or whatever <laughs> yeah like yeah, yeah, exactly. cats with and, and there's a fat cat with a sash and it says like chester a arthur with like a, a yeah. question mark and people are like oh, that's so accurate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there there were a lot of them too <laughs> that are exactly what you just described oh my god he would, Chet Arthur would even sit on his porch sometimes at like three o'clock in the morning, probably drunk as fuck <laughs> and like ready to like talk to anyone that came by. <laughs> this is something that I would do. It's, it's like something a... that Chris has literally done. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I, uh, I was just thinking of like Friday, you know, the movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It was at one of these parties uh, that Arthur got in good with the New York City elite. And among them, the new Republican Party boss, Roscoe Conkling. Oh. Get out of 
Get your lemons and get out your dancing shoes. <laughs> yeah, uh, Conklin. The... <laughs> He's Conklin into our hearts and our town. Yeah. <laughs> and probably at one of these parties, although in the future, uh, is the one where uh, Gateau would somehow get in and actually meet Chet Arthur mm. and give him like the speech, you know. Yeah, fuck that guy. Gave, <laughs> yeah, to help get Garfield elected. Yeah, that he gave in his bathroom but, to himself. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Every night before yeah. bed. <laughs> he said it in the mirror, so there was at least one other guy there. Yeah. yeah. You're never eating alone if you have a mirror. <laughs> oh, man. Now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> So at this time, Ulysses S. Grant was president, and the Grant administration, by far, without a doubt, is the most corrupt administration in United States history. Well, because of their yeah. embrace of the spoil system. Again, is it really the most corrupt? <laughs> I well, mean, time we're not talking time about hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking about like like modern times. Uh, this is straight up like you're my friend. You get to be, you know, at the highest level of government. Huh. Oh, what about so, so, line? so completely different yeah. from uh, yeah, completely you're, different. You're my, from da- you're my daughter. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, you're right. You're right. You're my I'm just saying this is in history, <laughs> not yeah. in present time. <laughs> also, right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is a story for a different day. The Grant administration is. Uh, fascinating i think uh but conkling and the republicans of the time they loved this system they were getting rich off of this system and being the powerful senator and party boss from new york conkling was able to to secure top jobs for all of his most trusted lieutenants he was probably one of the most powerful men in the united states at the time uh even above the president Nah. So but, he he was he but, was like the man behind the scenes kind of. Oh yeah. Yeah, he was the man behind the curtain for sure. Oh, like Wizard of Oz. Uh, yeah. That's literally the reference uh, you made. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I I I thought he was talking about uh some of my relationships before my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know they had a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> And who was the most trusted lieutenant of Roscoe Conkling? Who? Who? Chet Arthur. Oh. And They're in was, league. He was miraculously appointed by Grant to be the collector of the New York Customs House. Oh, damn. So, yeah, so damn. Arthur got a cut of everything that went through that port and quickly became an even richer man. He bought oh. only the most expensive clothes and hats imported from London, and smoked the oh. finest Havana cigars. Went down to the hat store and got himself a hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think he I had jewel-encrusted guns yeah. with diamond bullets and was like, ain't nobody else uh, going to buy these? <laughs> and actually, the guy who owned the gun shop that sold Gateau that gun, he was like, this gun was for Chester A. Arthur, but uh, he never came and picked it up because he was too drunk to get his way to the store. And he lost his <laughs> monocle in a monocle party. Uh, <laughs> a monocle party. You, you're, I couldn't see on the road. <laughs> so you, you're referring to John Layaway at the Layaway gun store. Yeah, it was the, yeah, it was the Layaway gun store. <laughs> <laughs> It was said that Arthur had at least 80 pairs of trousers. Oh. And in one eight-month eight period, he spent $125, which is about $2,500 today, on hats alone. <laughs> he, so he's got, like, the Chicago Bulls snapback of back in the glory days with the tag still on. I, I think I, he has one of the really tall, uh, you know, tall, like, Top hats. Yeah, I figured they just made the one kind of hat, and he had like a bunch of them. Yeah, I think that's more accurate. (laughs) If if I have all the hats, then nobody will look as dapper as me. (laughs) Did he have like a pirate hat? You know, like all kinds of costume hats for his theme parties. Yeah, dressing up as uh, Jack Sparrow. 
Chester, Chester, <laughs> do magic for us. Uh, fuck, I can't remember what hat I left the rabbit in. He's going to be a good one now. <laughs> An old classmate of his remarked to Ar- Arthur about the inherent corruption of this system. And Arthur responded, quote, You are one of those goody-goody fellows that sets up a high standard of morality that no one can read. <laughs> that was him on corruption. Yeah. That's like the psychopath test where it's like, in your opinion, everybody's thinking about murdering you. <laughs> it's like, <"Yes."> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes Arthur wouldn't make it to work until 1 p.m. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone was out partying all night. Oh, well traffic. into the morning. Nice. Yeah, And oftentimes at places of ill repute. Oh. Now these oh, places were called... Like a candy concert store? Saloons. Concert saloons. <laughs> and oh. yes, there were prostitutes. Uh, oh. Yeah, I was going to uh, say a whorehouse. You mean the whorehouse? Yeah. yeah. Sex oh, I'm worker sorry. House? Sex, worker, sex worker house. I'm yeah. so sorry. Uh, it, it was heavily implied, although it's not known for sure if Arthur did or did not indulge in every vice, but... Arthur had a penchant for indulgence, so... He did it. Yeah, he did He did it. (laughs) Right. In these places, Arthur mixed with gangsters, prostitutes, pro- and anti-Tammany politicians. We'll kind of delve into Tammany Hall. They were the Democrat political machine in New York at the time, Hmm. and it's illicit history. But he mixed with everybody in these places. They actually had a sobering up room. For some of the richer people <laughs> nice. Uh, oh, nice. in these places. So Where you, you could get shots of mercury into the tip of your dick. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you didn't have to mix with the common rabble on your way out the door. So you didn't get like rolled by some street toughs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the gravy terrain came to a screeching halt when Rutherford B. Hayes was elected president in a controversial election. It was one of those popular vote versus 20 electoral votes type of thing. Mm -hmm. We almost didn't have a president for a little bit. It went to Congress to decide. But in any case, uh, Hayes, like many presidents of the time, tried to appease the Southern Democrats because there was a lot of money. Most of the money from the U.S. was coming from the South. And the more, you know, the North didn't have as much industry surprise surprise Mm -hmm. sure uh, as the south did uh so they tried to appease them all the time and it didn't work (laughs) Mm -hmm. so this is post-civil war yeah it it is but but so there's there's factions of the republican party that wanted to really punish the south and those that wanted to keep the south going Mm -hmm. you know regardless of whether or not slavery had ended. Oh, I'm, they wanted I'm just to be surprised. like, yeah, slavery. <laughs> you know? I, I'm surprised that post-slavery yeah. and uh, during Reconstruction, the South would be able to get like an industrial machine that would essentially make them valuable to the North so quickly. Well, they wanted to, they were trying to find a way to rebuild them um, back up to where they were uh, without slavery. Yeah, have and fun with that. They were doing slavery light, basically, is what they were doing. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's what they were doing. And all the lashings perfect. with only half the calories. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, I mean they that's, paid them yeah. less than a living wage. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Good thing we're past that. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Hayes instantly started an, an investigation led by John Sherman. Uh, it, who, if you remember, is the man that Garfield was initially supporting for president, um, into the corruption of the New York City or the New York Customs House. Yeah, to find corruption. And to cut a long story short, it was all over whether or not a non elected official could make decisions and a boatload of cash on behalf of the United States while being beholden to a political party. That's what it was all about. Th- okay. That sounds like the most corrupt. No, it's the, that's the most corrupt. That is sounding. corruption. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hayes tried to make Arthur resign his position. And if he did, he would get the, the consulship in Paris, which is kind of weird because that's what. That's what right. that yeah. 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 And Arthur refused um, him. Him and the stalwarts and Conkling were basically just denying Hayes at every turn. 
So Hayes waited until Congress wasn't in session and fired him. <laughs> Fuck. And it, yeah. And so the newly minted stalwarts of the Republican Party, the response was crazy. Led by Conkling, they made Hayes' pres- presidency hell for the man. They blocked everything he wanted to do at every turn. Again, he even so tried to. Yeah. Conkling was the Mitch McConnell of his day. Yeah, yeah, okay. in a way. In a way. Did he look like a frog man? No, no, he was a very dapper man. Nice. Uh, Remember, he had that, like, like quaffed hair with oh, his curl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Superman, Clark Kent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pockets full of lemons, the sweet ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hayes, like, tried to appoint a Democrat to the Customs House. Uh, he even tried to uh, appoint Theodore Roosevelt Sr. Wow. to the position, but they just blocked everything. They were like stalwart or nothing. You know? yeah. uh, are you are every, you sure that they didn't mean right it was um, it wasn't Theodore Roosevelt Sr. It was the Mexican equivalent to Theodore Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt Sr. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> they can't uh, all be gold guys, you know. So Arthur, you know, now out of a job, he quickly started to work on the Edward Cooper campaign, who was a candidate for New York's mayor. Yeah. And he was the new chairman of the New York Republican Executive Committee. Ooh. Committee. Uh, Arthur and, yeah. Arthur and Conkling successfully ruined Hayes' presidency, ensuring that he would not seek a second term and pretty much ruin his reputation to this day. Nice. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yeah, like, it was this big mess where they just, they had a lot of power, they had a lot of money, and they stopped an entire president. Yeah, that showed just how much they had. Wow. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So they were at the top of their game going into the Republican National uh, Convention in 1880. Yeah. And we talked at length about the National Convention. I'm not really going to go back into it on this one. Mm -hmm. Uh but uh, the fact was, is that uh, Conkling and the stalwarts, they wanted a return of that spoil system under Ulysses S. Grant. Well, yeah, but, I mean, it made them a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, indeed it did. And they, they, yeah, they just, they were happy with the machine at this time. Welcome to the uh, machine. Yeah, so yeah. long story short, Conklin gets on a table, does a little dance, eats a lemon, everybody likes it, and then and then <laughs> Garfield comes up, gives a rousing speech, and wins everyone's hearts and minds. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That is what happened. And Conkling and the stalwarts, they conceded. They were like, okay, you win this battle, but we're going to win the war. And so they're like, okay, well, your vice presidential candidate would be one of our own. Chet Arthur. Right. And they're like, okay. Because they didn't have the same power. You know, Vice President didn't have the same power that they have yeah. today. He's like, and so he, it was it was a safe bet. Mm-hmm. He's like, Vice President, sounds good. How much does it pay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Arthur could kind of continue doing what he was doing, you party. know, as Vice President. Mm-hmm. If anything, it probably behooved his party boy lifestyle to keep Garfield alive as long as possible. Because he's like, I don't have any <laughs> fucking responsibilities. And I get like all of like the prestige of being, you know, the president's right hand man. Guys. Well, that's guys. That's pretty much exact. Think about it. Honestly. Can, can you imagine a vice president party partying with the VP? Not this current VP, but I mean, yeah. like, like just with the vice president, like keg stands and fucking, you know. <laughs> Playing yeah. really shitty techno in the basements, you know. Like, you know, yeah. you know. What honestly, I'm talking about. I can't. I don't want to party with Joe Biden. I don't want to party <laughs> with Mike Pence. Uh, I mean, in I, my I, life, I don't time. want to party with Al Gore. Um, you know, well, actually, I mean, for facts, you don't party Gore. Look, yeah. Gore would be that guy, like from Animal House, the guy who's like playing acoustic guitar outside of the party. <laughs> yeah, and and, and, and and you know, GW is uh, is fucking uh, what's his face. The big boy, John Belushi. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. He's Bluto. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's Bluto. Like, GW yeah. comes out and just smashes the guitar. And then yeah. he screws it back and says, sorry. Like, yeah, he, <laughs> he's like, stop being a pussy playing your acoustic guitar. Let's go start a forever war. And Dick, Cheney's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dick Cheney's there and, you know, Get he's like Luke drinking out of the team cup. Forever war. Exactly. So for most of Garfield's presidency, Arthur stayed in New York with Conkling. 
after being assured that Garfield won't touch the customs house, he fires Conkling's man and nominates his own man for the customs house. Mm-hmm. So was it was it- looking like a Hayes thing all over again. Uh-oh. No bueno. Yeah, so Arthur and Conkling try everything. They dig up a post office scandal that is loosely connected with Garfield, but ultimately damages Conkling more than it does Garfield. Because <laughs> uh, he, he, like, he was tied to it more than, like, more oh, than shit, he was. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got too many scandals. Like, <laughs> Can't keep track of them all. Yeah. They filibuster Garfield's nominations until Garfield removes all of, all of his other nominations, except for the one that was pissing them off, a guy named W.H. Robertson, and it totally inflates the situation. <laughs> never never trust a man whose first name is initials. I've said it before. I'll, I'll say it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> Always a snake oil salesman. So as vice president, Arthur worked with Conkling against Garfield, and people would remember that. As the story continues, this this adds a a, a, a rich layer to uh, to to pretty much everything that happens with Gato killing Garfield and the position yeah. it puts Arthur in after that. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. So that's why I felt it was necessary that we should do this episode right afterwards. Sure. Right. Yeah. It was here and for this reason of the customs house that Conkling had the delusional big idea that he was going to resign his Senate seat, and then um, and then he thought he was going to be immediately reinstated by uh, his beloved cohorts, you know, his beloved uh, people around him. And like we talked about last week, everybody hated him, and he didn't get his job yeah. back. Again, by yeah, Felicia. Cause... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right? After, yeah, because Conkling's rise to power had left blood in the water, hey. and no one wanted him back, you know? <laughs> So after Conkling committed political suicide, Arthur had the good sense to kind of not be seen with the man in public for some time. <laughs> I mean... At least not until the president had been shot. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I really can't be seen with you until uh, the president is shot. <laughs> if he gets shot. Which I mean, he if, won't. If. You know Conklin was like, why can't we be together? And he's like, look, I'll get back together with you if and when the president gets shot. Famous last words. <laughs> if. <laughs> yeah. Pretty sure Johnson well, said that. Yeah. <laughs> well, on July 2nd, 1881, Garfield was shot. Oh. Now, Arthur, who had never wanted to be president, Fuck. received the news with utter shock. Him and Conkling met up, and they went to the Fifth Avenue Hotel, which was a prime hangout spot for the political elites at the time, mm-hmm. and a Reporters were sw- were swarming the area, and they were trying to kind of get through them. And as they kind of like signed in and whatnot, uh, Conkling went directly inside and didn't talk to anyone. But Arthur kind of turned around and he was like, I- "Is everything okay with the president?" Right. And they just kind of like they they started jumping on him and saying like it was heavily implied in the newspapers while Garfield was laying on his deathbed that it was. Arthur and Conkling's doing that they had a hand in this. Well, mm. not to mention they stood if, the most to gain. But Gateau was you, the one that, uh, was shouting that he was a stalwart and that it was like he's he's yep. doing this for the benefit of Conklin and those guys. Well, and so, if and you're the even vice, say Arthur can be president. Yeah, right. yeah, if you're the vice president of the United States, you shouldn't have to ask the press how the president's doing. <laughs> well, I mean, not, not a great look. we don't have the internet. We don't have the internet. Like he didn't get the up-to-date information. Like he got a telegram and they rushed down to the, you know, they didn't well, have up, up-to-date information. He should get out his portable induction coil and call the president. <laughs> <laughs> there was even a saying that was starting to pop up at the time. Chet Arthur, president of the United States. Good God. That's what <laughs> I was like waiting for the rhyme or like the no it, nope that's it <laughs> just like Chester A. Arthur I'd rather get my dick blown off by fireworks I, I don't know like I, I much <laughs> oh. I think he'd agree yeah, with you uh, honestly 
Yeah. yeah. How is this going to affect my uh, rock and roll lifestyle? <laughs> <laughs> so Arthur kind of distanced himself from Conkling and kind of sequestered himself inside in his home. And he became more and more despondent. One of his friends uh, said that when he went over to see him, that Arthur was just sitting in a chair staring out a window and his face was like streaked with tears. <laughs> like, <laughs> the dude was brother. not well. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to have not so well. many responsibilities now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's got you know, half you're... a line of coke still there that he hasn't done. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur tried to visit Lucretia Garfield, uh, but couldn't really hold himself together while he was in her presence. Uh, he didn't stay for very long. Uh, it just didn't. He was an emotional guy, you know. He was a little <laughs> bitch, is what you're saying. No, he wasn't. It, Again, cry it's baby. not a little bitch move to cry, Zach. Men can cry. Well, I'm strong not- men cry what? too, Lebowski. Well, <laughs> this is this is back in the day when men weren't allowed to cry, though. It is true. Yes. 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 That's why he, he was, was also bitch. crying because he didn't want to be president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, he's like Lucretia. I know we don't know each other that well, but maybe you be president because you were like his wife and you knew you knew what he was into. <laughs> yeah. The the people closest to Arthur they feared that he was on the verge of an uh, an emotional collapse. Like, he was a mess. He was a mess. He was way past that. (laughs) (laughs) On September 19th, 1881, James Garfield died. Oh. And Arthur, Arthur, he had a couple of people uh, that he was close with at his home uh, that night at, at the time he found out at 123 Lexington when the telegram came to his door. It said that Arthur had to be sworn in as president of the United States immediately so at 2 15 a.m on september 20th 1881 new york supreme court justice john r brady swore chester allen arthur to the presidency at 123 lexington the only place in new york city today that has ever been witness to the swearing in of a president well good thing also the would... laziest address in the country <laughs> one two three <laughs> Well, good good thing that that guy was there uh, that late at night because it was a monocle party. Yeah. Oh, they Ooh. they went they they had to roust him. They had to like bring him over to Arthur's place. Oh, and before that, he was rousting someone at the monocle party. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm gonna fan cast this right now. Chester A. Arthur is Will Forte. <laughs> just so we can see and be like no 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 fuck 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 yeah. <laughs> as the responsibility is just getting heaped on his lap that's great people like kind of had to leave him alone and like in his room at that point he like held like the telegram in his hands and like held his head like in his hands too and he just like <laughs> Like, held his head in his hands, like, between his legs, like, in a room by himself for God knows how long. <laughs> like, the dude was not cool with being president. <laughs> All of his telegrams were like, hey, Google, stop. Yeah. What is president? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, he couldn't have just stepped down? Why didn't he? This is why he didn't step down, is what we're coming to next. Because while Gar- Garfield was still dying, and Arthur was trying to come to terms with being president, this is like the most, in my mind, the most interesting thing about Garfield. This is absolutely insane. Um, he received a letter from a woman he did not know. Her name was Julia Sand. She was a bedridden, political junkie, invalid. She had like spinal problems, but it's kind of unclear what she had. Woof. Um, she sent him a letter, and the letter moved him so much that he kind of rose to the occasion and changed as a man for the better. And a lot of people point to Julia oh. Sands' letter. But here's here's the first one, if you'll indulge me, just because uh, it had such a profound impact on Arthur's life. Here it is. The hours of Garfield's life are numbered. Before this meets your eye, you may be president. The people are bowed in grief, but do you realize it? Not so much because he is dying as because you 
are his successor. What president ever entered office under circumstances so sad? Your kindest opponents say Arthur will try to do right, adding gloomily, he won't succeed though, making a man president cannot change him. But making a man president can change him. Great emergencies awaken generous traits which have lain dormant half a life. If there's a spark of true nobility in you, now is the occasion to let it shine. Faith in your better nature forces me to write you, but not to beg you to resign. Do what is more difficult and brave. Reform it is not proof of highest goodness never to have done wrong, but is proof of it sometimes in one's career to pause and ponder and to recognize the evil, to turn resolutely against it. Once in a while, there comes a crisis which renders miracles feasible. The great tidal wave of sorrow which has rolled over the country has swept you loose from your old moorings and set you on a mountaintop alone. Disappoint our fears. Force the nation to have faith in you. Show from the first that you have none but the purest of aims. You cannot slink back into obscurity if you would. A hundred years hence, schoolboys will recite your name in a list of presidents and tell of your administration. And what shall posterity say? It is for you to choose. <laughs> she guilted him into doing well, a good go. job. Yeah. Yeah. She was pretty much like, <laughs> the president's dead. Yeah. You're going to be the president either way. I know you suck. You know you suck. <laughs> but could you just not suck for a couple years? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know about much, you guys, like, but I still respect Arthur all the got time. Got a letter like that. So, can, can you guys say those lines again? Zach, say what you said. Uh, I just said, I don't know about you guys, but I still uh, recite Chester A. Arthur's name. I know, it's kind of yeah. too bad. I know. As a boy. We were kind of like, oh, I just said, what if uh, Spiro Agnew got a letter like that? Right. I, it, that was a uh, different circumstances for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it, it was this letter that that made him rise to the occasion. He he got a lot of letters from Julia Sand over his presidency, <laughs> and he took a lot of her advice. Honestly, uh, she, she was running. And every back. time, he, I thought you were talking right? about Julian Sands from the Warlock movies. <laughs> no, Julia Sand. <laughs> Close enough, Julia Louise Dreyfus. <laughs> she she sent a lot of letters to him. Um, Whenever he, he didn't take her advice, she would uh, like admonish him. She'd be like, you're, you're being afraid. You're being a coward to, <laughs> to your political opposition. She would talk very frank with him. And he would, you know, she was probably the only person that talked to him like that. Just like Sand, she just got everywhere up in Chester and Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Scott Walker was not a fan. No, not at all. It's his least well, favorite uh, president. <laughs> <laughs> now this is pot racing <laughs> now, you're gonna say, now this is politics <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's what you're gonna say but it's telling how how um, moved he was by julia sand's letters because at the time of his death arthur was kind of ashamed of his previous life and so he had all of his papers and letters and stuff burned except for the 23 letters that survive today in the Library of Congress written by Julius Sand. So he saved those. So, so that's when, telling. when any big policy decision came his way, was he like, I'm, I, I got to collect all the information. Let me go check my mailbox really quick. And I'll have a decision <laughs> right after I get back. <laughs> well, uh, Julius Sand had nothing to do. Again, she was bedridden. She really followed politics. She would send him letters all the time about upcoming stuff. So she was before he had time to, yeah, seriously. Sort of. <laughs> running things. He even visited her one time, uh, which is kind of a big deal for like a president to just go and visit somebody out of the blue. You he know? thought she was way hotter because of the pictures that she sent. <laughs> <laughs> totally catfished him. <laughs> uh, I think a part of her was kind of in love with him a little bit. I think they, at least she had kind of a thing for him, maybe. Well, and he was hoping that he could bang the the maladies out of her. He's like, if I just if I do it real good, she'll she'll be able to like you know get out of bed. Yeah, didn't work. No, though. I don't. I don't. Ar Arthur was actually very in love with his wife, and when his wife died, it like changed him as a man. Oh. So when when she died, like 
he he would always lament like i wish no was here to see you know me be president me do all of these things you know mm-hmm. but he, he was like after my wife died the monocle went on and it never came off again <laughs> <laughs> So after remembering what Julia Sand said in her letters, Arthur made the fateful decision to turn his back on everyone and everything that had gotten him to where he was now. Much to Roscoe Conkling's dismay, Arthur gutted the spoils system and the patronage system making huge reforms in the civil service, making it impossible to do what he himself had done. (laughs) He's like, if I can be president, this system does not work. (laughs) (laughs) He was the Groucho Marx of his time. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Conkling had turned from friend, like Arthur's best friend, to Arthur's most bitter enemy. They sparred, Uh, But ultimately, Arthur won the day, and he set the stage for the upcoming progressive era. Now, this is something I want to I kind of wanted to talk about Uh, these civil service reforms. What that means is that if you're in the civil service, you are not beholden to a political party. Mm -hmm. And that's what Arthur changed about this country. And we kind of overlook that in this day and age. And the more we overlook that, the more we let what is happening now which is a glorified, basically a patronage system, uh, happen again. That's what we're doing. We're letting that happen again. Right. Looking at you, Kushner. Uh, When Trump talks about the deep state and how the state is against him because he's a Republican and these are Democrats that are working in the civil service, uh, he fails to realize that it is not only illegal, but uh, Chester Arthur changed that you can't be beholden to a party. So he's simply wrong mm. by saying that. And it starts here with Chester Arthur. So good thing. That's the wrong. only thing he's wrong about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the president should listen to our podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And Corona will be gone by Easter. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll see. Meanwhile, I'm well, getting some egg dyes out, you know, so I can have an Easter egg hunt inside my bunker. <laughs> Uh, Arthur would rebuild the United States Navy uh, from the Civil War era Navy to sort of what it was in the Progressive era, like pre-World War I. That was Arthur's doing. Oh, he's going to get that razzle-dazzle uh, going. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think that uh, Arthur ever got to set foot on the monitor? Because that, uh, be you know, I sick. don't. I don't know. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if he did. He also renovated the crumbling White House. Remember when we were kind of talking about how it was a shit White House was kind of yeah, there was like rats and stuff. <laughs> he, he renovated it. Uh, he spent lavishly because again, he was rich. Uh, he got his buddy Tiffany to make these insane chandeliers. But the there there was one thing. There were these stanchions. These um, uh, it sort of blocked off areas and it was these Tiffany stanchions that were in the white house for a time. But, uh, Theodore Roosevelt actually, uh, when he renovated the white house, uh, he had them broken down and sold off as glass what? and none of them survive now. Yeah. Oh, they would have no. been worth a fortune. God damn it. Teddy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pieces of it exist, but, uh, it, in all of its glory, uh, we only have like drawings of it now. Mm. Oh, uh, to see it. Uh, Leave it to Roosevelt to not know anything about nice things. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real man's man, you know? Yeah, he's like, you can't bring you can't bring that camping. Throw it in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, in in Arthur's mind, he was he was making policy decisions based off of how he thought Garfield would have wanted them, because he knew that the American people did not pick him. They picked Garfield. Mm -hmm. And Garfield was an idealist. He was this, again, he was a dynamo. And all of a sudden they don't have him, like so early into his presidency that he decided that he would do what Garfield probably would have done. And then he wasn't going to seek a a second term. And there's a lot of reasons he wasn't, but 
again, he just never wanted to be president. So there was that, yeah. right. you know. Uh, I was just going to say he's just going to kind of keep the, the ship on a steady course and then just step down. Yeah, pretty much exactly what uh, they, they tried to when, when he left office in 1885, uh, he returned to his home in New York and they tried to get him back into the mix. You know, the stalwarts, they tried to get him back in there because being president, he had some weight. He had some clout. He, he declined. Uh, and when he left office, actually, he left very respected by everyone like he he went into the office being very un you know untrusted no one wanted him there and when he left everyone was very impressed and everyone pretty much loved him except for uh, that, well except and, for Kong. <laughs> and that is under promising and over delivering that's why yeah, i, I told is. every girl i've ever dated that, that my, my penis is one inch long uh, <laughs> and, and a quarter inch thick because anything you get after Chester. that. Yeah. yeah. They're a bit of a Chester Arthur. Yeah, yeah, I tell him I got good toe dick. <laughs> <laughs> and then after a number of Google searches, they 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 get the reference, they want to leave, and then I pull up my totally normal penis and they're like, never mind, I'll stay. This isn't weird at all. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I met my wife. <laughs> and what a lucky lady she is. And on November 18th, 1886, not long after he left the office, Chester Allen Arthur died of a cerebral hemorrhage. God, he, the presidency killed him. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. He was exhausted after that. Uh, he had a distrust of the media. Like, there's, huh. there's all these reasons why uh, he's obscure to this day. Um, because the media blamed him for Garfield's death, he never wanted to talk to them anymore. No, they're the fake so news. So there's really, yeah, there's no, uh, you know, there's no interviews with him. He burned all of his papers because he was ashamed of his past life. So we don't have any of that information. And let's face it, Arthur lived in a foggy era of American history. And so people just don't really remember him. And that's too bad because he did some stuff that, we really take for granted today and we should know today. Mm -hmm. He uh, invented the hangover breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could go for one of those Ro right now. Yeah. yeah. Roscoe Conkling. He remained in politics until the day he died during the great blizzard of 1888 in New York city. Conkling attempted to walk the three miles from his law office on Wall Street to his home on 25th Street near Madison Square. He refused to pay a coachman 50 bucks to drive him there what a <laughs> because the snow was so crazy. 50 bucks is a lot of money. I yeah. know. <laughs> He's like Larry uh, David. It's a principle of the thing. Hey, uh, man, surge pricing is a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Conkling made it as far as Union Square before he collapsed. And uh, he contracted pneumonia and he died several weeks later on April 18th, 1888. Pretty much forgotten too. His, that, that his was family was left uh, it was left all of his uh, hair cream and uh, also uh, a pile of lemons. The sweet ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, actually in Madison Square Park, on one side of it, there is a statue of Chet Arthur, and on the other side, the opposite side, sits a statue of Roscoe Conkling. And they're two sort of endlessly leering at each other <laughs> forevermore. I can't wait you for know? this to be over so we can go back to New York and take a look at that ourselves. Right. I want to see that. Yeah. I wanna I wanna go there. It's like we always were just sunny. there. It's like I always know. sunny when I, uh, I, Mac and Charlie are staring at each other in the yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you gotta. Uh, and just real quick, I, I do want to mention our sources uh, for these two episodes. Uh, the first one is uh, the the Destiny of the Republic, uh, is what it's called uh, by Candace Millard. And Candace Millard is one of my favorite uh, nonfiction authors. She's amazing, and that that dealt mainly with Garfield's assassination. I highly recommend that book. That's a fantastic book. And The Unexpected President by Scott S. Greenberger, also a fantastic book. Read them one after the other. It's, it's really great. 
it's really great. If you want to know more, and there is a lot more that we did not touch uh, on this episode, uh, I highly recommend you go and check those books out. Well, there you go. Or you could just listen to our podcast and get all the deets from us. (laughs) Yeah. 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 What, are you going to read it and jump Um, around by yourself? Come on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like some kind of square Jerry. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, that's Ted Arthur. And uh, he he truly was a good president. Uh, Obscure, yes, but he truly was was a good president. The the original hipster president. Yeah, (laughs) indeed. Yeah. Oh no! When when we Indeed. saw the when when Jerry shared the pictures uh, um, yesterday, we were like, "I well, I was thinking." I immediately thought hipster. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Garfield's only really remembered for his facial hair. Yeah, oh. or Garfield. Uh, uh, Arthur. Arthur. Arthur, right? No, like Chester uh, definitely looks like uh, some idiots that I went to college with in Portland. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> for all the Portland Portland listeners listeners down there. In Portland. do we have listeners in portland i'm well, sure we do let us know listeners yeah. in portland. let us know yeah. about your mustache yeah what kind of must what kind of product do you use in your mustache and if you have a garfield situation or god damn it if you have a arthur situation going on uh send us a picture throw it out if you yeah. have a gateau situation going on, don't send us any pictures. No, please. I, I don't want to see that. But if, yeah. you do, but if you are having a Garfield situation, let me see that sweet, sweet lasagna pictures. Oh, <laughs> yum, 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 yum. Ooh. Yeah, make a lasagna. You got time. Hey, make a lasagna. I think that that's, uh, that, that's yeah. a wrap for today. It's our that's first. a wrap remote recording hence the uh quality of the audio on my end yeah let yeah, us know on all of our ends either way we all we all love you guys and we really yeah. do appreciate you guys and it is a uh, a strange time that we're living in yeah and uh we just want we want to bring knowledge and smiles to to all you guys these are we're uh, here to entertain you these are uncertain mm-hmm. times i and people are scared. We don't know what what's happening, and that can be very unnerving. But uh, yeah, we'll try to have a good time in the time being. You know. Well, hopefully we can take, you know, take your mind off of it for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I we mean, are the other piano man. Constantly <laughs> referencing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, with that, should we wrap things up, guys? Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm Chris Whedon, a uh, one history boy. I'm Tyler Armentrout, also an A1 history boy. Zach Mack, I'm a history boy. There you go. I am Jerry Nash. I'm also a history boy. Uh, don't forget to follow us on the social medias and uh, send us an email at historyboyspodcast at gmail.com if you are so inclined. Yeah. And, you know, leave us a rating or, or a review and all you if at you home, can or yeah. feel so inclined. All you at home, you're also history boys. We're all history boys. <laughs> We're in this together. Yes. Love you, bye.